Voices. Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership, a series focusing on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in public health. I'm Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and to introduce today's guest. I want to tell you a story that our speaker's twin sister recounted. When our speaker was a child, a tornado raced through her Cleveland neighborhood. It sent the household into chaos. Her father yelled and gathered up the children and sent the family into the basement for safety. But all of a sudden, our speaker was gone. According to her twin, no one could find her. The family searched upstairs, outside, and eventually down the tree littered block. And there at the corner in the middle of the street was 10-year-old Donna directing traffic. <laughs> yes, our speaker today is Dr. Donna Shalala, known by some to be a leader of leaders. Whether serving as U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration, the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in the Carter administration, co-chairing the Commission on Care for Returning Wounded Warriors in the Bush administration, or being President and Chief Executive Officer of the Clinton Foundation, Dr. Shalila has been at the forefront of decision making and policy building all her life. Not only has Dr. Shalala's leadership been demonstrated in government, but also in education as president of Hunter College, chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and most recently president of the University of Miami. Named one of America's best leaders, President Bush in 2005 presented Dr. Shalala with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award, and in 2010, she also received the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Services, which recognizes individuals for outstanding dedication to improving the health and lives of disadvantaged populations. One of the most honored academics of her generation, Dr. Shalala has been elected to seven national academies, including the National Academy of Education, America Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Michael Sinclair, Executive Director, Harvard Ministerial Leadership and Health Program here at the school, please join me as we welcome Dr. Donna Shalala to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Well, Secretary Shalala, quite the career. Um, you've been quoted as saying that um, you have found that your cup of tea is very complex institutions. Uh, when did you discover that? And what specifically about complex institutions attracts you? I think that because I like solving problems, but um, I also like not being bored. So complex institutions are like puzzles that you have to work out and you have to understand. They require empathy, that is understanding where people are coming from, the different elements of an institution. So the pattern of my career has been really to lead institutions that are very complex, that have multiple cultures, and um, that require teams, flexible teams, um, to lead them correctly. Um. Our students here are, are very keen to, to learn from you. Um, we at Harvard pride ourselves in the fact that all the students here are very smart. Um, but um, intellectual ability, technical capacity is not necessarily synonymous with drive. Um, I want you to talk to us a little bit about um, the drive uh, that has, has, uh, has been the energy behind your career. These things don't happen. Um, without a specific um, intent. You were in your early 30s when you became a university president in the middle 80s, a woman university president. Um, how did that happen? Uh, a little bit by chance, not very, in a very disciplined way. I mm -hmm. went to graduate school because someone I was in love with was going to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> we hear he that hated often. it. He hated it. 
I loved it, so I stuck around. I actually wanted to be a journalist, so I wrote to the New York Times, and they weren't hiring at the moment, and they said go back to the Cleveland Press, which I had worked at, but I really wanted to live in New York, so my academic advisor said, you're a good enough academic, why don't we get you a job in New York? So I, yeah. I ended up in the academic world. The chance to be a college president, I was sitting, uh, or the chance to go to Washington the first time, all of these things have stories attached to them. Um, I got a chance to help uh, solve New York City's fiscal crisis when you in say the seventies. Was this serendipity, or uh, you, no? You, I was in the right place at the right time, a little, and I was awake. Mm -hmm. I say to people, <laughs> you've got to be awake to take advantage of opportunities. Look, I was um, uh, at Teachers College, running the politics and education program, and working in the graduate faculty of political science at Columbia. When I got a phone call from. Uh, the chief of staff for the new governor. And here's what the guy said to me. He said, we need someone to put together the governor's budget. Mm. Everybody else who's an expert in the state of New York's budget work for the Republicans. Mm. So we're jumping a generation to get to you because the guy that's currently running uh, the budget taught you at Syracuse and he said you're both a good Democrat and you could put together the budget with him. The governor said to me after we put together the budget, I'm going to find something for you to do. Would you like to come here and be budget director? I said, no. I want to get tenure now that I'm on this academic track. He said, I'll find something for you to do. So the summer of 75 picks up the phone and said, what are you doing for the summer? And I said, you know, not much. I'm starting to get organized because I'm going to write a book. I have a Guggenheim Fellowship in the fall. And he said, well, he said, it looks like New York City has this fiscal crisis, and I think It'll be done by the end of the summer. I'm going to appoint you to this board with all these famous investment bank people led by Felix Rowan, the chair of Lazar Frere. And uh, they think I'm appointing you because you're a woman, but you actually are the expert on the subject. I had written my doctoral dissertation on the politics of fiscal home rule, hmm. which is the relation, financial relationship between states and cities. Whose dissertation ever helped them in their <laughs> career? <laughs> So I joined this board with these fancy uh, Wall Street guys, and I actually was helpful because I did know more about uh, state government um, and state fiscal policy than they did. And that, in some ways, launched a non-academic career. Jimmy Carter, then when 77 was looking for women to put in the administration, the, the then Cabinet Secretary Patricia Roberts Harris and actually um, the head of domestic policy, Stu Eisenstadt, both tried to recruit me to come down. I eventually took the assistant secretary's job, frankly, because it, I thought it would give me more career choices. That is, I'd learn more and I could go back to the academic world. It was the policy. It was an academic job in HUD. Um, and, uh, you know, I was coming back to the academic world, um, and someone called and said, hey, the Hunter presidency just blew up. Why don't you take that? I said, I haven't been a dean. I haven't been a major department chair. I mean, what are you talking about? I went up and interviewed for the job and got it. I mean, this is a funny career How? in which people I, pick uh, up the <laughs> phone and they call you. But in all of these jobs, whether it was as assistant secretary or at Hunter or at Wisconsin, the consensus was I wasn't qualified or HHS. Uh -huh. They so, said so she wasn't a doctor. You know, she didn't have the right qualifications. She hadn't had enough years in place. You're 30 years old. You're interviewing for the job of a university president. What do you tell them that persuades them? You know, they were so desperate to find someone, <laughs> I think. You know, I told them, uh, first of all, I had done a lot of management at, at uh, HUD for Pat mm -hmm. Harris. I, I actually, and the secretary of the treasury at the time was a man named Mike Blumenthal. And I actually played tennis with him. And he said, you know, if you ever want to come back to this town to be a cabinet officer, you got to get some management experience. And he actually offered to take me, I, he was going off to head some corporation, mm. um, uh, take me with him. But, um, you know, I wasn't going to go into the private sector at that point. And I thought, gee, here's my chance to get some management experience. I, I knew nothing about managing public institutions. But it seemed like a great adventure. And the story of my career from the Peace Corps on has been, does this look like some, a place I can learn is it going to be an adventure, uh, not am I going to enhance my resume? Mm. So it's, it's the joy of taking on, I love new jobs, the joy of taking on something that's complex, that's interesting, that's going to be good for people. Mm. You want to know what drives me? It's that. Mm.
It's the adventure part of it. It's exactly why I went to the Peace Corps instead of going to law school, because how, how that much, seemed like more of an adventure. How much in your career um, as a woman, given that you've, you've been pioneering in, in many respects, have you felt driven by the need to outperform your male culture poets? Well, there, when I went to graduate school, um, the faculty at Syracuse had this idea. They couldn't recruit the males that would go to Harvard, but they could get women that were just as good. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they spent a lot of time investing in our careers, uh, the women that they were able to recruit for the PhD programs. And Scotty Campbell in particular, Alan K. Campbell, who had been a big Harvard guy um, in political economy, um, he and Steve Bailey, a very good political scientist, really focused on helping women. So I think that that helped. The department chair at Syracuse said to me, I'm not going to give you any money uh, because women don't finish their PhDs. I mean, I suffered, I can't say heavy discrimination, but people said stupid th things to me throughout my career. Um, someone early in the day said, well, because you're a woman, you know, did it affect you all the way up? The fact is, once you get real power, they don't mess with you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they know who's in charge. No one ever discriminated against me when I was secretary of HHS. I bet, yeah. <laughs> I read somewhere recently um, leadership described as envisioning a destination with a road map and getting there by putting one foot behind the other. But if nobody's following, it could be a lonely journey. What do you think of that? I think it's kind of silly myself. <laughs> let me tell you why. In every job I've interviewed for, except Secretary of Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. because the Clintons, uh, the president, really knew me already in my various jobs. Uh, I had known the two of them before they were married, actually, so we just kept in touch over the years. Uh, I'll tell you why it's silly. In every job I've ever interviewed for, they wanted to know what my vision was of the institution. I had no idea what the details were of the institution I was interviewing for. I mean, you know, I'd read their handbooks. I knew something about where they thought they wanted to go. Anyone that has a vision before they go in, I wouldn't hire that person. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, if they know how to organize people for a direction, for a strategic uh, direction, that's the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. It's not, what is your vision for the institution? Um, I just... I almost laugh at people when they say that. But at some point, you need a vision of where you're going as a leader. Yes, with the but you work that through right. during your first couple of years by understanding the institution, the complexity of the institution, where they have been, and where, um, with data, with conversations with people, where you can anticipate going. Now, in every institution, you want to get better. You want to appoint first rate people, and you want to get better but you also want to lead them all in a direction. I've described myself both as a tugboat camp captain, as a leader, and um, as a world-class nudger mm. to move people. It's not that I haven't identified a direction for the institution, but I haven't done it alone. Mm. I've done it with other people, fully understanding the culture of the inst and the place of the institution where I've been. So each institution went in different directions. I can march you through each institution that I've led, and each one had different cultures, different kinds of leadership, different history. But to say, you know, walk in and say, this is my, or interview for the job and say, this is my vision for the institution. Um, I tell the story about getting the Wisconsin job in which they were afraid to ask me about athletics. <laughs> So uh, I said, well, what do you want from your athletic programs? And their answer was, we just want to be competitive. My answer was, I don't know how to do that because I only know how to organize strategies to be number one because I come from New York. <laughs> <laughs> I got the job. <laughs> I don't know whether it was specifically for that, but uh, one of the guys said, you know, let's give the girl a chance. So she, at least she likes sports. <laughs> But you have to get people to follow. Uh, both academia and, and government are, are well known for having entrenched bureaucratic procedures okay. um, and resistant to change. Um, you came to all of these institutions as, as, as an outsider, technically. Um, how do you get people to follow? Well, first of all, you make sure that they have leaders and you have leaders that you're working with that have the respect of the staff, the mm -hmm. bureaucracy, the, of the faculty. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about HHS, very complex uh, institution. 
for me, HHS was almost the easiest job I've had in a long career because it was more hierarchical. Mm -hmm. But I also had an opportunity to influence who would head each of the agencies. And I wasn't afraid of the complexity because it's not very different than a major research university with lots of deans that have power mm -hmm. and have their own financial basis. So um, I understood the different culture between FDA, CDC, NIH, the Public Health Service, um, the Children and Families Group. They, they were absolutely different cultures, needed different kinds of leadership. The key to HHS with the president's total support was to appoint people that were distinctive leaders for each of those agencies that would be deeply respected by the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. uh, not only respected by them, willing to be led by them. So my attitude to the bureaucracy was, it was our colleagues who had been waiting for us for 12 years. And I was going to, with the president's uh, advice, give them leaders. So David Elwood from uh, Harvard came to be the assistant secretary, basically the policy assistant secretary. Mary Jo Bain was going to run children and families. Mm -hmm. Each, those two people were at the top of their fields. And, um, and the case of Mary Jo had yeah. real management experience. Yeah. But we got a Nobel laureate to head the National Institutes of Health. We got David Satcher, who had been dean of Morehouse, um, to um, uh, to run the CDC, Phil Lee came back as assistant secretary uh, for health. Uh, these were these David Kessler stayed at FDA. So choosing the right choosing people the with right, the right people expertise with expertise mm. and respect who were um, national and international leaders yeah. in their field is a good way to start. But working them into a team is the challenge. Yeah, as it is in higher education. That required that we all agreed. One of the exercises I used in, during my first couple of years is I made them all sit in each other's budget hearings with uh -huh. me. So NIH would come to FDA's budget hearing, and then they got an assignment, a homework assignment. <laughs> they had to do the department's budget. Oh, my goodness. By the time we got finished with those exercises, not only did they learn what they were doing that was overlapping with each other, but they were supporting each other's budgets mm. in a very different way. There are a series of, of, you know, the management experts give you what I sometimes think are kind of silly exercises. There are exercises you can do in government. I had a big table at the department. Everybody was invited for every major policy decision we had to make. Whether they would come or not was their decision. But if Kessler was going to make a series of decisions about uh, uh, about tobacco, for example. All the health people would show up, but everybody else would show up too. You think Mary Jo Bain wasn't interested mm -hmm. in the impact of tobacco on children? So everybody else would show so up. inclusiveness and co-responsibility. Yeah, I yeah. also encouraged them during the summer to bring their interns. Yeah. Every once in a while I'd call on an intern to get yeah. their idea. But, but the, what I did in that room was after we had heard all the arguments for and against and what the strategy would be, we went around the room and everybody got to talk. Mm. And people that served in um, the Clinton administration will tell you those stories about every single person got to talk, <coughs> including Bob Williams, who was totally handicapped and talked to us through a computer. I would stop someplace else in the room and give him time to get his um, his message uh, out, and we would go all the way around the room, and everybody would comment. Yeah. And in that group, no one passed. Yeah. Everybody had a <laughs> I view. I bet, peer pressure. But that's how you create a sense of teamwork. You could do it socially, too, and we did some social things at the same time. Mm. But it was, it was an extraordinary experience for me, and that's why I'm saying the leader can't walk in, think up a vision. Yeah. Particularly not if you put a group like that together. Sure. If you put Bruce Vladek at what is now CMS, uh, he's going to have strong views. And everybody wants to play on his policy because he's running Medicare and Medicaid. But you have a table full of strong views. At some point, you have to say, this is the direction. Yep. Yep. At some point, you make the decision. Yeah. I always made the decision in the room. Right. I didn't go off and say, well, let me think about this a little, yeah. uh, which a lot of people recommend. I would listen. First of all, I'd be, be very well prepared because I have the briefing papers. And then I'd listen to everybody's arguments. Mm. Would I reverse it sometimes? 
yeah, Medicare was about to go out on a major uh, change. And I actually stopped it in the room after I heard everything from everybody. Everybody was ready to sign off and said, let's test this in three states. Mm. Because this sounds very complex to me. And, um, and, and the response from the Assistant Secretary for Legislation was, oh my God, we're gonna miss the deadline. I said, give me the key Congress people. I'll call them up personally and tell them we're gonna miss the deadline, the congressional deadline, because I want to test it in three states, yeah. and I'll tell them what states I want to test yeah. it in. You've also said you love messy situations. I don't know what's to love in a messy situation, but how have you I mean managed? Complex. Have you how have you <laughs> managed? <laughs> how have you managed crises uh, of which I'm sure you've had to deal with many? You know, um, the worst thing in a crisis is to jump on the issue immediately mm -hmm. because you're getting enormous pressure from the press, from social media, and everything else. You've got to get everybody in the room and calm everybody down and get the facts. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I always did when I was policy making was to make sure that three people in the room, uh, four people, the legislative person that did the politics, the communications person that had to explain it, the general counsel, and always the inspector general. Mm. No one else worked with an inspector general the way I did because I wanted the inspector general not to not investigate us if we did something wrong, but to anticipate um, what holes we could fall into. And they were more experienced than anyone else. But when you had to handle a crisis, you really had to have your communications and your political person in the room, along with the substantive person, because they would demand that you were very clear that you had all the facts. That was number one. Number two is I never handled a health crisis myself personally getting up in front of the cameras at the White House. Mm. I always demand that one of the docs did it. Mm -hmm. And I told them to put their white coats on. <laughs> <laughs> the spokespeople in the United States ought not to be the political appointees, whether or not they're docs, but the most respected person in that area, but they also have to speak very clearly mm -hmm. about the issue. So you often had to train them to be able to do that. But we had a rule in the department that the expert got up because the American people had to trust the spokespeople. Right. And you know, if you think back um, on crises that have gone as uh, astray. Often it was because it was the political appointee, not the expert. Right. But you can't you can't expect the expert to speak clearly about the issue, and to answer the questions that ordinary people would want to know. So learning about Q's and A's and um, and how to set up that press conference and putting them through some training became extremely important mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. uh, or we would trip up. And the follow-up was as important as anything else in the way we handled the press. Yeah. Inevitably, with hindsight, we all dwell on the high points of our careers. What are some of the things that you regret? Well, I regret not convincing the president to do needle exchange mm -hmm. uh, because I think we could have saved, and, and he regrets it now, too. If, if you know that Clinton, years later, said that was a, that was a mistake. Um, I don't regret the way we handled it because I knew the decision was going to go either way. So I got all the public health people to write a letter to the president and to sign it. We never backed off from the public health. We never said, uh, I think there were people in the White House that might have wanted us to say we needed to do more research, but mm -hmm. we never said that. We said the research was very clear. Mm -hmm. And we, even in the press conference when I announced the president's decision, I didn't back off from the research just that the president had a right to decide that CDC would not fund this. But we encouraged foundations to fund it. We gave them technical assistance in the communities through the NIH. So we, we, didn't, we didn't compromise our integrity or the president's integrity about the science. We simply defended his right to do it. So I regret that. Could we have been done more on AIDS? Yes, there's no question about it. But the next administration built on what we had done. Mm. One of the big controversies of the Clinton administration was welfare reform. How did you manage that? Uh, it was complicated. <laughs> it was complicated. 
basically, I was for welfare reform. I had, in fact, been part of the effort in New York State that Governor Cuomo had appointed to basically move the welfare system into a transition system. Mm -hmm. So I arrived with a view about that. Um, the Republicans had enormous uh, influence, and we got the president to veto the bill a couple of times. Um, my disagreement, and we all had an opportunity to express our views, was that we wanted him to veto it once more, because every time he vetoed it, we got a better bill. He didn't feel like he could. He was under enormous pressure from the Democrats mm. in, the, in the legislature, because they didn't want to run on not having a welfare bill. Right. They felt the pressure uh, at the time. So we got a bill that was not terrific with a promise from the president that he would fix it over a period of time, particularly in the second term, because yeah. we were about to go into an election. Um, and the way he got me to stay was he said, we're going to fix the bill, so you got to stay <laughs> in the second term. Um, and we did. We did a lot of fixes on that bill. But fundamentally, I believe that welfare should be transitional, with the exception of people that actually needed long-term care. And there were a lot of... Uh, but, but we implemented it very quickly. Uh, we, lost a, uh, we lost Mary J. O'Bain and yeah. Peter Edelman over that bill, who were close friends of mine, long-time yeah. close friends of mine. But we did a number of things um, later uh, which helped. And we didn't pretend, and the president didn't pretend that it was perfect. But we also implemented it faster than any bill had been implemented. Remember, we had done... 30 waivers around the country about welfare. The states were already experimenting. We already had uh, relationships with the governors. We knew their staff, so, so we could lot implement of, it. A of backroom work went into it. In the few minutes that we have left, um, what one or two things would you tell the students here um, as being the most important things to cultivate as they prepare for leadership in their careers? Well, I think they've got to they've got to have a certain amount of empathy. They have to understand other people's mm -hmm. lives. Compassionate if, purpose. Yeah, but you know, it's some of this is understanding culture too. But they have to understand where poor people are coming from, what mm -hmm. their experience is. Um, you can't sit around a policy table with everybody that grew up in upper middle class homes. You really have to understand. And I prided myself on appointing people that had different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So you have to. You have to have that kind of empathy. The second thing is you have to be, you have to listen. You can't make big decisions if you don't listen and don't insist people tell you the truth. And third, you have to make friends in unlikely places. I have a lot of friends on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. I went off to the Washington Times constantly to brief their editorial board. Um, I, I ha still have Republican friends yeah. um, because we had to put together legislation in a bipartisan manner. I make friends of people that disagree with me. And in leadership, if you don't learn how to do that, wherever you are on this earth, you can't make good decisions. Yeah. That's a great way to end, Donna. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. <laughs>